suppose to begin with, um, <clears throat> 20 years ago, I would have uh, been working in the courts, filing stories, and would have had to scribble things down in longhand, and I would have had to reverse the charges to, if, or call collect, send the story by phone to somebody in the city, and maybe the story appeared the next day in the paper. Could you describe in your own feelings and words what you think of today's media landscape? I went to journalism school like a thousand years ago, and your professors used to tell you when they looked at your writing, you know, show, don't tell. The great thing about journalism today is there is technology now where you can show, tell, listen, engage, interact, and respond, all as part of doing journalism. So that's, that's I think, a very profound change in how we communicate and how readers communicate back with us, our audiences communicate back. The second thing to remember, I, oftentimes there's a lot of gloom and doom about what's happening in the journalism world, but the reality is that there's never been a larger audience consuming journalism since, I would say, 1450, since the Gutenberg Press. I mean, Kara is probably heard, uh, read, and engaged with by more people today than ever before in all our journalism years. I think so there is a huge amount of like positive stuff that's happening, driven by technology, given by social media, that's sometimes lost in kind of all the kind of worries about where is it going. Mostly because journalists just literally are the most negative and risk averse people on the planet. And cynical. Not cynical, it's not even cynical, it's just stupid, like really. Um, <laughs> because they, you know, they sit around and it, what's fascinating to me is, I, I'm always saying, Journalists, business journalists, which I am, and Raju works for the Journal as a business publication. Um, many journalists who write about businesses have never run a business. They don't understand what's happening to their businesses. They don't understand what's happening at the profound level of media itself. And one of the times when I was at the Washington Post, when I left to go to the Wall Street Journal, um, I, had, I had been writing about retail and a bunch of other things. And I started to write about a small company called America Online um, out in Vienna, Virginia. And the minute I started using it, it was so obvious what was going to happen. And Don Graham, who's probably the most wonderful publisher in all, the Grahams are probably one of the most wonderful <coughs> publishing families, um, stopped me when I was going to the Wall Street Journal. And I was hired to cover the internet, which was not anything at the time. Um, and when I got hired at the Journal, two things happened. The people in media, do you remember how obnoxious those people were? The people who covered media were literally, the reporters were just as obnoxious as the industry they were covering. And the reporter, one of the reporters from media said to me, oh, you'll be covering um, CB radio, meaning it was a fad. And I said, no, I'm going to be covering the decimation of your job. That's what I'm going to be covering. Wow. Um, and when I walked out of the Washington Post, Don Graham's like, oh, why are you leaving? We love you here at the Post. You can cover the White House, which would have meant I would have covered that dress, Bill Clinton dress, disgusting. Monica Lewinsky. Monica Lewinsky's dress, yeah. Um, and, which would have been gross. Um, and I walked, when I was walking out the post, Don, who's such a sweet guy, came over and said, why are you leaving? And I said, the water's rising and you're on a lower floodplain than the Wall Street Journal. Like, it's gonna end for you here because of classifieds, retail, everything else. And one of the things that I always notice is journalists don't understand business at all. They don't understand the business implications of what's happening. It's also a function of how journalism evolved, right? I mean, the whole notion of church and state has become so ossified that you actually refuse to understand how business pays for your journalism. Mm. I think that's contributed to kind of um, this sense of not just cynicism, but just a lack of understanding. It's also funny how uh, the Washington Post savior today is Jeff Bezos, who's made all his money on technology. Right, exactly. The interesting thing is, though, the various power brokers in the internet world, Google are creating AMP, you got um, Facebook creating its uh, fast pages feature. Um, I probably called that wrong. But, um, Instant wrong. In, yeah. So, so basically, they're also making forays into basically how the structure of publishing as we know it is going to be for the next, the plumbing, I suppose, of, of publishing. How, how do you think that will play out? I think there should be a willingness to kind of say that we're not going to mortgage our future to go chase the new, new thing. The fact that you need to be on Facebook, nobody is questioning that because they have a huge audience and you need to be there. But the fact that you have to put all your journalism in Facebook Instant and have everything be there, I think that's something you have to ask yourself a hard question, saying, is this going to help my business model or not? The Wall Street Journal is a good example. We try to engage people on Facebook, but we are absolutely unwilling to put all our journalism on there unless Facebook figures out a way for our subscribers to engage with that. So I think you have to be very selective about how you do this. There's definitely one of the bets we made and the journal made and other places made is that quality counts. People do like content. 
there's this whole canard that young people don't like quality content. It's just ridiculous. It's, the, young people are very smart. They love quality content. They're not a bunch of idiots. Um, you know, uh, nobody like goes to the, like I always say this, nobody goes to the store and says, I would like the crappy meat, please. I mean, some people do. But, um, <laughs> but it, it, it's just this idea that they don't want, it's just the way they want to consume it. Is, is the way they want to consume it, so why not give it to them the way they want to? And it doesn't mean you have to necessarily dumb it down. And to pretend that stuff earlier wasn't dumb is also crap. Like, there's a lot of bad stuff before, it just was on a printed page. Hmm. Actually, radio, as you know, is one of the most seamless ways where advertising and content can live together, because you don't really kind of get too interrupted in the flow. Or if you think VR and AR are going to be a big way of consuming, the ads in that can actually be very, very seamless, right? Like you're walking on a street and there's a billboard and you're experiencing it, but you don't think of it as an ad. So I think there are certain trends like that, driverless cars. Even if you imagine 2% of the world's drivers will be in driving but in driverless cars, that's a lot of time that you gain. And whether you can take advantage of it and whether you are in there with the cars and whether you become kind of the content that they actually listen to. Mm -hmm. All these open up a lot of possibilities, um, I think, from a revenue point as well. And, and, and by the way, driverless cars, it's 2% now, but it's going to be 100%. Everyone's going to be in drive. And then you'll own a car as a hobby, like you mm -hmm. own a horse or a motorcycle or something else. Um, so that's going to be an entire thing, because you, you'll be able to be consuming content right there. Or if you're thinking about VR, you've got, like, you've got to be thinking outwards, like VR, and then also in an AI environment, which is artificial intelligence. How do you operate there? Um, and I think one of the things, you know, you can get some very, and, and voice activated stuff, which you just talked about. How many of you have the Amazon Echo? I've sold more Amazon. Get the friggin' Amazon Echo, all right? Yeah. It's super cheap. You need to understand where content requests are coming from by using it. It's this little device, it sits on your thing. Mm. Um, interestingly enough, Google and Apple do not have competing products. Not, yet. not mm. yet. They will, but it's astonishing they have. They don't. So the silver lining I see in it is that storytelling can get richer. I think just so many ways to tell a story, so many ways to impart information. Uh, one of those, um, when I think about the future of media, I think about recent acquisitions that News Corp made of um, Storyful, for example. Um, you guys bought that company, Irish company set up here in Dublin for 18 million about two years ago. Um, How much? 18? Not a lot of money, but 18 you million euros. <laughs> and the um, other part it of it. It's a lot. Um, Fox Media bought you guys, Rico, last year. Yeah. Um, what about the, the seismic shifts we're going to see in terms of ownership? Uh, for example, uh, Rajiv, you could tell me a bit about why the Storyful acquisition matters to News Corp and how, you, how you're integrating it into your company. Sure. Uh, I'm Storyful is based in um, uh, Dublin, and the reason to buy it is because it also says something about the industry. If there was not hubris, and if the Associated Press didn't have its act you know, so messed up, there wouldn't be a story for it. Just as there wouldn't be a political if the Washington Post didn't have its act messed up, right? So, but the reason to buy a story for it was twofold. One is that there's a belief that there's a lot of content that's going to be generated by kind of people with phones, because they can. Um, and, but at the same time, it's important to verify that that's the content if somebody says it's a video from Iraq, it better be a video from Iraq rather than a two-year-old video from Iran. Verifying it, yeah. Right. Verifying is a big aspect of it. And then, um, finally, the whole notion of licensing. Because just because somebody has shot an amazing video doesn't mean you can just use it. There's a whole layer of services there. So that's kind of the reason to buy Storyful, uh, both as a business and also it helps our own kind of news brands um, as well. But going back to your larger question, and Karen and I were talking about it earlier, I think there are a lot of... Uh, great companies that have emerged in the last decade, um, whether it's BuzzFeed or Vice or uh, Vox, for example, where they've shown that they can engage and retain and grow audiences in a very rapid way and kind of um, bring down the average age of uh, their audience in a big way as well. So for all those reasons, I think they're interesting. Um, there are lots of question marks around whether it's a sustainable business model. But my view is that you make your bets on smart people and you expect the businesses to pivot and change, but if the people are right and you bet on them, then they'll figure it out, right? Jim Bankoff is a great example yeah. of that. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's interesting is we got sold to Vox um, relatively quickly after getting invested in by NBC, and then NBC then invested in Vox in a much larger way. Um, one of the things that's interesting about the sustainable business model part, the questions are coming from companies that actually provably don't have a sustainable business model anymore, right? Media companies who question mm -hmm. New media companies, we know the old media companies are dying.
Want to be in the audience next time? Click here for tickets to InspireFest 2017.